This is one of the most controversial cases in recent years in Latin America. When it had just happened, many people asked me to make a video. It was one of those cases that I realized that time needed to pass to be able to make a complete video. That's why after a year and a half, we decided that it was time to talk about the Colombian case of Mauricio Leal. We are heading until Monday, November 22, 2021. Mauricio Leal had an important commitment that morning. He had to sign a contract because he had been hired to be an advisor to Miss Universe Colombia, which was an ideal opportunity for his career. He was a renowned stylist from that country. But although Mauricio was a responsible man, that morning he did not appear to sign the contract. Hair and Karen Ruiz were father and daughter, they are important in this story. They both worked with Mauricio. Hare was his driver and right-hand man while Karen worked at the hair salon, but he had formed a strong friendship with Mauricio. That morning, Karen contacted her father to ask him if he knew anything about Mauricio, but Hare replied that the last thing he knew was that at 6 in the morning in 20 minutes, Mauricio had sent him a WhatsApp message telling him that he wanted to sleep longer. In Mauricio's mansion, located in La Calera, lived Mauricio, his mother named Marlene Hernandez, and his brother Honier. Hair and Karen first tried to communicate with Mauricio, but he did not answer or reply the messages. Then they tried to talk to Marlene, the mother, but she didn't answer either. Finally, they called Honier, the brother, who answered and said that he was not at home but that he had the key, but that he could only go to open the door in the afternoon, so they arranged to meet at the entrance of the mansion past two in the afternoon. Throughout that morning, they tried to call him without success. Karen mentioned that every time she called, after two rings, the call would hang up, which meant that someone was deliberately rejecting the calls. She said that she called at least seven times and never received any answers. At 2.30 p.m., Honir, Mauricio's brother, and Hair, the driver, arrived at the residence. Both of them opened the locked door. Although all was quiet, the house seemed normal, with no signs of burglary or violence. They went to the main room, which was Mauricio's room, but they couldn't get in. The door was locked from the inside. They knocked on the door waiting for Mauricio to get up, but no one answered. The driver then left the house to try to enter through the bedroom window. He opened it, and there he found a terrible scene. There were the two lifeless bodies of Mauricio and his mother, with obvious signs of stabbing. Mauricio still had the knife stuck in his abdomen, but it was striking that his hands were gripping the bladed weapon. It seemed as if he had done that to himself. A letter written and signed by Mauricio was also found at the scene. In this letter, he said that he couldn't take it anymore. He apologized to his mother for what he did and mentioned that he left everything to his brother and his nephews. Mauricio Leal Hernandez was born on November 24, 1973 in Cartago, Valle del Cauca in Colombia. He came from a family with little money and because of this he had a very difficult life at the beginning. Mauricio, from a very young age, went to the hair salons in his neighborhood to pass the time. He had been fascinated by how a haircut could change a person's mood. He would spend hours watching the hairdressers do their work and he wanted to be a part of this. Mauricio had three brothers. He was very close to Honier, his older brother but his mother was his greatest adoration. Marlene Hernandez was a very active lady. She liked to do activities to keep herself busy. Also, after seeing her son's fascination with hairdressing, she had signed up for a course to learn, and although Mauricio was too young to attend, she allowed him to go in with her to observe from the window, which made Mauricio sure that he wanted to do that when he grew up. When he was 15 years old, the family moved to Cali. 
At that time, his parents separated because they had a turbulent relationship with constant fights. Mauricio himself had asked them to stop living together. That is how Mauricio took charge of the house. He wanted to be the one to provide security and money to the family, despite the fact that the father told him on multiple occasions that he was not going to be able to do that, telling him the girl of the house and constantly doubting their abilities. Without neglecting school, Mauricio went to work packing orders and delivering arapas. But he had never lost his passion for hairstyles. A year later, he met a lady who went to church and got him a job at a friend's hair salon. There he started as an assistant. He opened and closed the business, washed the customer's hair, served drinks, washed the bathrooms and swept. Those tasks made him aware of all the details involved in opening a business of these characteristics, and he was able to learn by watching experienced hairdressers. It didn't take long for him to start working as a hairdresser himself in that place. His first job as a hairdresser made him very nervous. It was the first time he was going to do a haircut. He was afraid that the client would not be happy besides, he was still a minor and he did not have an academic background beyond what he had learned by watching. Although he was a beginner, he displayed incredible skill with scissors. Within a few months, Mauricio established himself as one of the most trusted and talented hairdressers in the business and in the city. More and more clients were asking for Mauricio. At that time, he continued to go to school and sometimes he even wore his uniform at work. But the boss, despite his age, saw that he was very talented, so she decided to raise his salary. Everyone suspected Mauricio's homosexuality, but his father was the only one who made derogatory comments about it. Mauricio would simply remain silent if someone asked him if he was gay. Over the years, Mauricio got a portfolio of clients that paid a good price for having him as a stylist, making him achieve some fame in the city of Cali in Colombia. But, although he had a good salary, several clients came to comment that if he decided to open his own hairdressing salon, they would go with him. He saw how much the hair salon earned from his work and how many of the clients only wanted to cut their hair with him. Also, as he perfected his technique, his colleagues began to lose clients because they all wanted to be attended to by Mauricio, which made him feel the envy of his colleagues for this whole issue. So it was not long before he took the plunge and opened his first store. The salon bore his name Mauricio Leal. Knowing that his name was synonymous with quality and that many clients would go quickly when they saw his name in a hair salon. Although his first beauty salon was not luxurious, Within a few days, he had a full schedule of clients. Demand exceeded his expectations, so he needed to hire employees. The first one he turned to was Honor, his brother, who had been observing Mauricio's effort and achievements and decided to follow the same path. He did not feel a deep love for hairdressing as Mauricio did, but he was interested in earning money. He immediately proved to be an efficient collaborator. It would be the first of many Mauricio's employees. Thanks to his mix of hard work, talent, and business vision, Mauricio was able to run his own empire and earn enough so that his family did not have to suffer any more financial problems. But he wanted to go for more and for that reason he moved to the city of Bogota, to the capital, where he would have the possibility of growing nationally. The success was even greater because celebrities from television, music, and movies began to get to know Mauricio's work, making him, in a short time, one of the most prestigious stylists in the country. No surprise, his work began appearing on magazine covers, on TV shows, music videos, at Fashion Week, and movies. But what stood out the most was his personality, Mauricio never lost his charm, how well he treated his employees and customers, how friendly and cordial he always was. Many began to call him by the nickname Maito. 
In the year 2006, Mauricio wanted to expand further, this time to other countries. He wanted to turn his hair salon into a global brand. For this, he created a company called Aim Commerce SA with one of their most loyal clients. Thus, they opened the first international branch in Miami, Florida. According to reports, this woman who had associated with Mauricio was the daughter-in-law of a drug dealer, which caused Mauricio, without knowing it, to be placed on the Clinton list, which is a list of people who has some kind of commercial link to drug dealing. This caused his bank accounts to be frozen and thus he lost a lot of money. When this happened, Mauricio decided to put his mother in charge of the company to be able to save the situation in a certain way, to be able to free up his money, be able to pay his employees and not lose the company that he had built with so much effort. Before continuing with this case, if you like the investigations we do on this channel, Press the like button, subscribe, and press the bell to be notified of new cases. Now you can also be a member of the private sector for just 99 cents a month. Having access to private posts, videos before being published and without advertising, in addition to exclusive emojis and the battery badge that is being charged with the months. To become a member, you have to press the join button on the main page of this channel or if you are on your phone, through the link in the description. Now we continue with this case. Let's go back to the case. Mauricio and his mother had been found lifeless on the bed in the main room of the mansion. There was a farewell letter and everything pointed to Mauricio having murdered his mother. As we mentioned, the mother was in charge of the company the authorities were wondering if maybe the mother made a very serious mistake with something related to her son's business. And that's why the son decided to kill her, and then decided to end it all. Although at first glance, the evidence showed this. Everyone agreed that Mauricio got along excellently with his mother and his brother. He was too fond of them, so that if it was a murder, it made no sense to anyone. In the same way, when the crime had just occurred, the media talked about this possibility. November 24, two days after the event, was Mauricio's birthday. The investigation was still ongoing, and the autopsy was complete. The document showed that Mauricio had three other fatal wounds in the abdomen, apart from the final wound where the knife was, which meant that if the other three wounds were fatal, Mauricio could not have made four in total, because the first wound would have already taken his life. There was no chance. With this new finding, the investigation officially became a homicide. They began to speculate about Mauricio's past. He had had problems in the past with alleged links to drug dealing. The authorities wanted to make sure he didn't have any enemies or someone who would have been angry because when he had been put on the Clinton list, he had to talk to the authorities in order to clear his name. And although we don't know how far that investigation went, Mauricio was removed from the list in 2014 after months of being questioned. And it was not surprising to analyze that perhaps after that investigation, other people had fallen. Although the murder of Mauricio and his mother occurred in 2021, drug investigation cases often take years, even decades, to finally arrest other suspects. With this hypothesis, raids were carried out in the mansion and commercial premises of Mauricio from December 2021 to January 2022, hoping to find something that would lead to a criminal organization. At the same time, there were many people in the crosshairs. The brother had been questioned. He mentioned that he was not at the residence, gave an explanation of what he was doing that morning, and the police began to investigate this alibi that he had mentioned. Then there was the driver, who was Mauricio's right hand, and it seemed strange that he had not had access to the residence in case of emergency. 
and this implied as if the driver needed someone with him to find the body. Besides, he was the one who went up to the bedroom window, which he could have done all morning while Honir couldn't go to the place. He was definitely, at least to the authorities, suspicious. Later, the authorities learned about Mauricio's life. He had made many enemies over the years because many envied his success. Colleagues who did not like him and perhaps felt that without Mauricio, there would be a better chance of recovering clients. What was taken into account was that the knife found at the scene had been taken from the kitchen, and this suggested that a fight possibly started in the residence and the killer found the first thing that came to hand, which ruled out the possibility of being someone outside Mauricio's inner circle. Neither the doors nor the windows had been forced, so according to the investigation, it would have to have been someone that Mauricio led into the residence. While the police were investigating every possible line of investigation and multiple suspects, one person in particular began to behave very strangely. Hanir, the brother, appeared in the media wearing a Mauricio's jacket, calling Hauer his driver and assuring that he would be in charge of the hair salon because he wanted to honor his brother's legacy. At the same time, he was saying all the time that Mauricio had committed that crime. So he was the one who murdered his mother. And then, we already know what happened, but this did not fit with everything the police had found. The media was talking about this being the biggest possibility at the time, so he was mentioning and assuring that his brother had indeed done this, that is, that Mauricio had murdered his mother. But the police have already made progress in the investigation and have determined that this would have to have been a homicide. Therefore, the investigation focused on him, and several pieces of information began to come to light. When Mauricio was investigated for the issue of drug gangs, he had left the company to his mother. What the authorities found out was that during that time, many people saw Honir upset because he had been working at the company for years, but his brother did not trust him to be in charge of the hair salon even when he was his first official employee. After this, Honir quit and tried to open his own hair salon. The business did not do well, and when the pandemic arrived, he had to close the doors, leaving himself in ruins. In addition, Honir was going through a divorce and had nowhere to live, so Mauricio offered him to live with him and his mother. By 2021, Mauricio was at his best, had successful hair salons, appeared in the media, rubbed shoulders with the most important celebrities in Colombia, and began to explore a career in music and had also announced that he would release his first book. According to the prosecution, everything pointed to the brother for reasons of envy and money. Hanir began to feel a lot of resentment against his brother, but also against his mother. He believed that his brother achieved success in large part thanks to him, who was the first to agree to work at the salon, but it had never been considered, nor could he achieve the same success with his own hair salon. So it was this combination of envy and money. Thus, on January 14, 2022, the Colombian police arrested him on suspicion of having been the murderer of his mother and brother. The authorities had also found several pieces of evidence. For example, on the balcony of Honer's room, there were empty cleaning products, and these products, the investigators believed, were those used to clean the crime scene. Also, because it was analyzed that the mother would have been murdered in another room that was completely clean, but traces of blood were found on the stairs, which led to the hypothesis that the body had been carried from the place where the mother had been murdered, and then placed on the bed next to Mauricio. The toxicological test had determined that Mauricio consumed a sedative called Zopiclone, and had also received several punches to the face. What the prosecution mentioned also had to do with the letter found at the scene, because it was confirmed that the handwriting and the signature were of Mauricio.
Then the prosecution hypothesized that Mauricio had really been forced to write this letter when he had been tortured, brutally beaten, and at that moment Mauricio wrote the letter and left his signature. In Honer's bathroom, they also found traces of blood on the grate and on a towel. The security camera of the premises showed when Honer arrived on the night of November 21 at 11.37 p.m. and then left at 11.15 a.m. the next day. That morning, Honier had received the call from the driver, which was when he said he was not at the residence, but the security cameras confirmed that he was indeed there. Apart from this evidence, they had the driver's statement. He had mentioned that he felt pressure from Honier to enter the house, and that when he saw the bodies, he entered the room, opened the door for Honier, and when he was going to try to resuscitate Mauricio because he thought he could still be alive, Honier told him not to do it, not to touch anything because the scene would be contaminated. That within everything, it makes sense because when an event like this happens, you don't have to touch anything, but at the same time it was kind of suspicious, not even trying to help them in case they were still alive. Honer had also been found with a cut on his hand, which the prosecution believed had been made during the stabbing, which is something you often see in these types of cases. But Honer had stated that he cut himself with scissors at work, since he was also a hairdresser, but later he changed this version on two more occasions. Finally, it was found that Honer had too many debts and that in those days after the murder, he had withdrawn money in his brother's name. When he was arrested, he had more than 65 million Colombian pesos, which is equivalent to approximately $15,000. Let's go to one of the most controversial issues in this case, which is Honier's statement after his arrest. Most of the evidence that the police had was circumstantial, that is, they could not confirm that Honinger had done it. Evidence is circumstantial when it cannot be 100% proven that the suspect is linked to the evidence found. For example, Honinger's bathroom grate and towel were found with blood, but this did not ensure that Honinger had done it. If they found Honinger's blood in those samples, it would no longer be circumstantial, but would locate him directly. The letter was shown to have been written and signed by Mauricio. But this again did not say for sure if he was forced to write it, despite the existing theory of beatings and threats. The only compelling thing in this, which we can say is not circumstantial, has to do with the security cameras. There the entry and exit of Honor was shown, but since the room was closed from the inside, it could not be confirmed if Honier had left out the window, which in the end remained speculation. The only thing that wasn't circumstantial had to do with the call. The call that the driver had made to Honier that morning, and Honier said he wasn't home, but the security cameras showed that he was there, but that was all they had. So the prosecution, just to be sure, made a deal with the brother. It is important to mention that when the prosecution makes a deal with a suspect, it is, most of the time, for two reasons. The first is when the suspect is not the big shot in the case. That is, there is another, more important suspect. Then a deal is made with the person to be able to use the statement against the other, more important suspect. The other reason is when there is not much evidence. That is, most of it is circumstantial and there is a risk of losing the trial, then a lesser sentence is offered in exchange for a confession. Despite having the security camera shot, which for me is quite strong, quite important, the Colombian prosecutor's office decided to make a deal with Honor, possibly out of fear of not having enough to get a conviction at trial. Honor and his lawyer accepted the deal, and that's how he confessed the fact in a public hearing. Honier apologized to his family, said he was sorry, and also asked all of Colombia to apologize him. Now, a few months after this, in November 2022, Honier retracted. 
He said that he had been coerced into making a statement. That is, that the police or the investigators at that time forced him to make a statement in that way, that his lawyer had given him bad advice, and he decided to cancel the deal with the prosecution, pleading not guilty, and that is how he is currently facing a sentence of between 43 and 50 years in prison. The evidence that came out after this really puts this question of guilt, if Honiger was really the murderer. Although Honiger is the main suspect in the murder, there are also three hypotheses in this case. The first it's about Honiger being the only one responsible for the deaths, which is the hypothesis that the prosecution handles and that most believe in Colombia. The second is that Honir did not really commit the murder and it was someone else, while the third hypothesis talks about Honir and someone else, that is, that he had not done it alone. For the first hypothesis, there is not much to be said. The evidence against him is quite conclusive. It is true that much is circumstantial, that is, they do not place him 100% within the scene, but let's remember that there was that security camera shot, that when the driver called him before that time, he was still at home, and that was extremely suspicious. I think the majority think it was him, and the motivation is also quite clear, which according to the prosecution was envy and money. Since the trial is not over yet, he is obviously innocent until proven guilty. In the second and third hypotheses, we have to talk about the new evidence that was found after Honier hired a new lawyer. First, genetic material and blood were found on the pillow where the bodies were and on a hand towel in a bathroom on the second floor, which belonged to an unknown person. That is, the genetic material that was found and the blood belonged to someone who was unknown who he was. The second thing, which is even more mysterious, is that it was found that there was activity on the phone of the mother, of Marlene, at 1.51 p.m. that afternoon inside the residence. That is, the geolocation of the phone indicated that at that time and in that place, someone used that phone, but, according to the security cameras, Hanair had already left the house two hours before this, so if he was really the murderer who used the phone hours later, this is when we talk about the following two hypotheses. And the question comes in, could it be that Honir was really telling the truth? According to this hypothesis, Honir simply told the driver that he was not at home because he was about to leave. He saw that his mother and brother were fine, so he left the residence after 11 in the morning. At that moment, according to this hypothesis, an unknown person entered the mansion, murdered the mother, and then Mauricio. Now, this is the hypothesis used by the defense, after having pleaded not guilty, that supposedly Honir did nothing and they don't know what happened in that house, but there are still inconsistencies. Why would Honir lie to the driver? Because he hadn't even told him that he had seen him in the morning, he simply said that he wasn't home when the security cameras showed that he had left hours later. Also, if it was an unknown person, it could have happened that the criminal entered through the window. That's true, yes. But what was the motivation? If we really analyze this possibility, it's true Mauricio had enemies, other stylists who envied him, he also had this issue that linked him to this whole situation with the drug dealers. Only that, the drug dealers, if we talk about that possibility, usually they don't kill in this way. They usually do it in public places where there are no cameras, in seconds, with firearms, which did not fit with this hypothesis. Now, it could be the subject of envy, but it had to be someone from Mauricio's direct circle because no windows or doors had been forced. Apparently, Mauricio or his mother had let this person in, and that's when this murder or these murders happened. Now, the third hypothesis I think can be considered as more realistic. I still prefer the first hypothesis, but we are going to talk about this third. Perhaps, 
Honair did not do all this alone. The genetic material of another person was found. It was confirmed that there was activity on the mother's phone in the afternoon, which could mean that Honair was in the house during the first hours of the crime, then left the residence, and someone finished the job. In addition, Honair knew that mansion very well. He would know how to get a stranger in without being seen by the cameras, which would still make him responsible. Perhaps he did not commit the murder itself, but being the mastermind, it is still just as guilty than the one who committed the crime. What is worrying about this case, which is still in full trial, we still don't know if he is guilty. There is still no conviction. I don't know exactly how it is in Colombia, but in most countries, or at least what I learned doing these types of stories, is that when the prosecution generates a charge, they have to demonstrate with evidence that the suspect is 100% guilty in that charge, or else it would be reasonable doubt. That is, if a person is accused of murder in first degree, you have to prove that it's first degree murder and not something else. With this new evidence and with this third hypothesis, it could be that Honer was the intellectual author. That is, it would not be first degree murder and this would mean that the accusation is wrong. What usually happens with these situations is that the judge cannot determine guilt in that specific charge so the person ends up going free. And according to these new data, the accusation against Honer should have been that of conspiracy to commit a murder, which would be when someone is the mastermind. Again, I say, I do not know the terms or laws in Colombia, but this is what normally happens in trials, more than anything here in the United States. Hopefully, it will be different. I hope some Colombian expert or lawyer can leave us in the comments and enlighten us with these details to know exactly if there is a risk that Honer could go free if the accusation is wrong, knowing that there is new evidence that they move it further away from being first degree murder. Obviously, if this happens, it would be completely outrageous because at least to me, according to this story and looking at all the details, it would seem that he was either responsible or the mastermind. The oral trial is in the middle of the process and it is not yet known when it will be finished. I will probably be updating everything about this case on my social networks.